Hello, everyone, and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. And today we are excited to share our JSA virtual roundtables on a new platform to include a first in the industry virtual networking experience with a unique opportunity to talk face to face with other event attendees before and after this panel. As a quick reminder for everyone who has joined us today, we look forward to your participation during this event. So please feel free to add any questions that you might have into the chat box or request the mic to come on camera and ask your questions directly to our panelists. If you have any questions about upcoming roundtables, whatever that might be, such as how to register or how to participate, feel free to reach out to us at our website, jsa.net. By the way, just a reminder to mark your calendars, our next virtual roundtable will cover rising above COVID-19, the latest developments in hybrid cloud applications. That's taking place March 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So without further delay, let's get started. Our topic today is the new normal effectively facilitating online learning at every age. And as we continue to take appropriate precautions against the spread of COVID-19, we must consider a more permanent solution for online learning. Connectivity both for schools and students is as important as ever, as the ability to access the internet determines whether students can continue learning throughout the year. Our panel today will discuss the new and developing technologies that are being used to bring the classroom to the home and the connectivity issues that may need to be addressed, addressed to effectively facilitate remote learning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our exceptional executive lineup who will weigh in on our topic. Joining us today, we have Andrew Coe, founder and CEO of Covexa, Dr. Kevin Ryan, professor of Stevens Institute of Technology, Melinda Ann O'Neill, senior technology executive at Comstar Technologies, and Chris Bunio, senior director, higher education, at Microsoft. Welcome to all of you, and I would love the chance for you to introduce yourself and tell us about your company and your role there. Andrew, let's start with you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Laura, and thank I'd like to thank all the individuals who are in the world of education, especially our teachers. Um, it's been very challenging, I know, for the last year, and um, and there's incredible positive things to, to, to share for sure today. So thank you again for having me here. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Let's go to Dr. Kevin Ryan for a brief intro. Laura, I'm delighted to be here, and I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm a professor at the uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, and I uh, also run a graduate program on networking and um, wireless uh, computing. So um, we're, we have a fair amount of experience in teaching hybrid courses. Uh, so we were uh, able to bring that experience into the uh, uh, pandemic environment. So I'm looking forward to sharing what I've learned in the last year and a half with everyone. And I'm looking forward to questions and I hope I can help. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. How about Melinda Ann O'Neill? Let's, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Melinda Ann O'Neill. I'm with Comstar Technologies. I'm an executive technology strategist. So I've worked in technology for just under a decade now, which I know is relatively new in the world of IT. But, uh, you know, when this roundtable um, came to me as an opportunity to talk, I jumped at it because not only do I work in technology, I have seven kids four of whom are doing hybrid or online courses only. And my husband is a provost of a university, so I also get to hear that side of things. So I'm just really, really excited to be here. Wonderful, and Chris. Uh, hey everybody, thanks for having me here. Really great to be here. I wanna echo Andrew's uh, words when he opened that uh, this has been a trying year for everyone, so we applaud the efforts of educators everywhere. Um, I lead Microsoft's higher education business. I set the strategy and direction for how we work with universities, community colleges, and uh, vocational schools. And part of that is really helping schools build up the resiliency and the infrastructure to be able to uh, deal with everyday work, including pandemics, um, and looking at how we can support students on their learning journey. So I'm excited to be here with the other panelists and talk a little bit about what we've seen and where the world's going. Great segue, Chris. Thank you. Let's get started with some of our uh, round robin questions here. The first question is, we all know that the pandemic brought many challenges and still is. In terms of virtual and hybrid learning models, what technologies did you see emerge over the past year to help solve today's challenges? Let's start with you, Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'd say, uh, Laura, there's been so many uh, different technologies that have emerged, but I think the basic one is 
clearly the, the use of video, um, you know, learning, always had access to video, just like the rest of the world, but never uh, ever before it's truly become a real platform of collaboration. Uh, but some of the less obvious ones that I've seen also has been a lot on the systems in the back office has been the migration to the cloud. I think a lot of education institutions who may not have made that switch needed to get there to really have their applications and all the stuff running just as strong as a Netflix or an Airbnb would. So they really needed to modernize in a very quick way. Dr. Ryan, how about you? What are some of the technologies that you've seen uh, come to light over the past year? Well, absolutely. Andrew, that was a wonderful answer. Uh, very nice to follow that. Um, I would echo what Andrew said. It's the presence of video. And our school has decided to use the Zoom platform, which has worked out well. Uh, to add to that, what we've also what has also been done by our IT folks is that virtually every uh, classroom has audio and uh, cameras. So if we teach a hybrid class, Laura, uh, if someone in the classroom asks a question, it is heard by everyone. And likewise, if someone speaks in the online format, we all hear it. So there's there's really this nice exchange. So I would answer Zoom and the uh, the uh, uh, the equipping of the uh, classrooms with audio equipment and uh, cameras. And Laura, if I could add just one other brief thing. As a professor, what I found out is technology is absolutely key, but we also have to remember that it's not all technology. Uh, the students are feeling distance from us. So I'm especially aware to bring like an extra dose of enthusiasm to the classroom. And um, I wrote down a few things here. I have extended office hours with Zoom. I give um, exam review sessions with Zoom. And I'm, as, as many emails as we all get, I try to answer them very quickly. So I think technology is great, but the students want to know that, hey, you're still out there, that I can still reach you. Thanks, Laura. Absolutely. That human connection. Yes. Yeah, so important. So thank you, Dr. Ryan, for that. Uh, Melinda Ann, let's hear from you. I know that you probably have great insight, both from in your household and, uh, and also your, your spouse, too. <laughs> I do. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I thought about this. So while well, every institution already has access to whatever technology they're using to expand the need for multiple users to learn on a platform, right, whether it's Blackboard, Google Classroom, Zoom, whatever it is, the product I saw truly emerge was consultation. And I know that's not a physical product, but we had so many people reach out. And this is in the world of, you know, my career in IT. Uh, we use Google Drive. We use Office 365. You know, we use Zoom on occasion. This is our collaboration tool or, you know, Hangouts for messaging. But what, what I need is, will this model be able to sustain 500 plus students? How do I get internet access across the board? Can you talk, you know, walk us through the bandwidth problems um, that we have currently and, and how do we expand that? So really for us, the world of consultation was the product that just sparked a managed service there. So they, you know, we're finding that customers needed immediate solutions. They needed references to what are other successful schools doing because most of the clients we have are talking to each other in this circle here in the Metro Detroit area. Um, we're talking to clients across the United States, you know, and in other countries, and we're helping them with solutions. So being able to offer those references on what others were doing was instrumental um, in creating relief packages and, and seamless rollouts for collaboration. So I think echoing what, um, you know, the, the previous two said about collaboration, that's obviously the emerging technology, but consultation was the tool we used. Um, and I'll just back that with saying, can we just give Zoom an award for being an adjective now. <laughs> you know, the Oscar goes to Zoom for, for no longer being a project, but really being an adjective. And I've heard even IT leaders state that they have a Zoom meeting knowing it's a it's a WebEx meeting or it's a you know it's a Skype meeting or what have you, but it's now dubbed as Zoom. So kudos to you for being the popular kid on the block Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well said, Melinda Ann. And and to your point, you know, we, we're learning a lot too, uh, not just the students, but we're learning a lot and, and from use cases from each other, like you said, pointed out, and, and also uh, connecting through Zoom and, and other channels like that. So Chris, let's get your your take on, on some of the technologies that you've witnessed that are really um, uh, shaping the way that we're handling today's uh, problems and solving them. 
Sure. Thanks, Laura. So I think, you know, what we've seen is, and, and we really got um, into um, the response mode, um, I would say back in January of last year when we started seeing COVID show up in China. So we were seeing early signs of this coming. And the first thing we saw was this need to get um, classes moved to an online format. So really using the video platforms, using voice to just lift and shift existing learning models into the cloud. And I think, you know, a number of different technologies emerged. Obviously, Microsoft's offering in the space is Office 365 and Teams. Um, but we really saw that voice and video become the first way that people responded. Um, through the summer, as the uh, first you know, part of this uh, uh, pandemic response wound down, we saw schools starting to look at their recovery. And that was really, to Andrew's point, a big shift towards the cloud, moving infrastructure and critical systems over, and making sure that operationally they can keep on going. Um, I think at the same time, one of the big outcomes that we saw from the first part of this was uh, student success need to be a big focus. So thinking about how do we help students um, you know, achieve the results that they need. And the shift that we're seeing now is really into conversational platform um, and trying to bring back some of that personal touch and personal interaction. So moving beyond voice and video into chat environments, integrating assignments and workloads there. And I think that's where we've seen the real uh, sort of power of teams come together as the platform for that. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see the integrated experience of trying to move all those different parts of a classroom um, into one, um, you know, one kind of experience for students and faculty is really going to come to the forefront. So some interesting developments still going, even as we're still responding to this pandemic. Well, you just teed that up just perfectly for me, Chris, as we move to, uh, and it's not even planned. This is great. This is just off the cuff. So thank you, Chris, for that. We're talking about high speed internet accessibility issues, that there's still a, a concern and really impacting directly the student's performance. And Chris was mentioning a little bit about what plans, how we're moving forward with a roadmap of what IT departments are doing and, and looking at how to you know, work together to, to solve these issues. So what would be your insight into how IT departments are going about addressing the connectivity issue that exists now to effectively facilitate remote learning? What are they doing or need to do? Let's start with Andrew. Uh, yeah, even at the onset, connectivity is a challenge even for the most uh, high-speed connected areas and buildings. And so uh, we're seeing that challenge almost in, in like the Commonwealth of Virginia, where there's a great majority of rural students or rural families and households who can't get access to that. There hasn't been a, pro a silver bullet answer. Uh, I think that's the real genuine answer, but where, where, where I've seen whether it's a large district or rural one or an urban is a couple things. Number one, they've been addressing a lot of them by purchasing the, the little pucks uh, and, and issuing those alongside with the devices. Uh, I've also, we've also witnessed individuals uh, or organizations negotiate better deals and rates with a lot of the internet service providers. And then you got some really innovative individuals. And I think Chris probably could speak to about other types of technologies that are starting to come out to pilot, whether it's using different frequency on bands um, uh, or even satellite, low orbiting satellite type of access and those, but they're quite expensive in order to scale. I think the challenge is balancing the affordability and the sustainability of a lot of the connectivity and making sure that there is sufficient connectivity. I think we just having connectivity is not the right answer. You have to have sufficient, and especially with these high feeds of video, <laughs> just like even my experience when I opened up, it's not always enough. Um, I would also just say that what I've advised to one of the governors um, not too long ago is look not only at purchasing new things, but leveraging already the fiber that's out there. Department of Transportation, there's wires along those roads. Why are they not leveraging, finding ways to access those that are already there? So I'd say not a perfect answer, but I think there's been, we'll call it a maturity of understanding the solutions while the technology and the new advancements start to arise. Good point. Okay, well, Dr. Ryan, from your perspective uh, and leading classrooms, what do IT teams need to do or what are they doing that you're seeing that's working or what can they do to improve uh, to facilitate remote learning? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, just to kind of follow on with what, what was just mentioned, I, I kind of view it as IT support for two audiences. And Chris had mentioned this is, first of all, the IT support for the uh, professors and the uh, teachers. So our university has responded by, they called it a mobile technology kit. So they, they gave every professor a 
a portable uh, camera in case they're teaching at home. They gave us a, uh, a high quality wireless microphone. So there was support there. And we were fortunate that our campus um, has fairly good high speed Wi-Fi throughout. So as a professor, I felt the IT part, you know, department did a good job in uh, supporting our needs, whether we were teaching at home or on uh, campus. Uh, for the students, we've been fairly fortunate that uh, our, our uh, college students seem to have very good internet access. Um, so we're, we kind of lucked out there. The, the, the other thing that is uh, stressed is that we as uh, professors, like we're getting hit in the Northeast today with a storm, um, there's going to be power outages, there's going to be people not getting access to the internet. So we're very aware that not all of our students are going to have internet access when they need. So every lecture we have is recorded. And, uh, you know, Chris and Andrew and others, this brings up issues that after the pandemic is over, uh, students love recorded lectures. So, I mean, I think there's a fundamental change going on here. And, you know, are we going to keep this mode of hybrid classrooms even after the pandemic is over? So, Laura, I hope my answer helped. Absolutely. Well said, Dr. Ryan. Thank you so much for your perspective. Melinda, Ann, I'm curious to your <laughs> answer as, as you, uh, you know, are working in networking and, and with different pockets across the nation um, and getting their perspective and feedback on what IT departments are doing to address connectivity. So what would you say uh, they need to do or are doing correctly maybe at this point? Yeah, it's been interesting because connectivity issues have always existed, right? Nobody's connectivity has ever been perfect. So, you know, we come from a world where many students already had internet access at home, and Dr. Ryan alluded to that, um, especially in the higher ed market. Most students are already set up to work from home, uh, which is a privilege. What we were pushed into is a world where families are beginning to realize that internet is a necessity and broadband is a privilege with a price tag and that's not affordable especially for you know the area that i live in is low income the uh, below poverty rate of school aged kids in this city is 40.1 percent that's below poverty rate so if you think about that it leaders were tasked with addressing connectivity issues ensuring that you know students they, they were great with sending out surveys do you have a, a laptop or physical equipment, number one, to work from home on, and number two, do you have internet access? So some of the things that the districts here did uh, were very creative, very creative, and we'll see how this emerges moving forward, but something like putting hotspots on school buses, parking those school buses in apartment complex or low-income neighborhoods to ensure that students who didn't have internet access, which again is a privilege, could somehow access the internet between those school hours. So those unique challenges are what, you know, we've seen our leaders have to address, especially in this area, um, extending Wi-Fi, uh, adding access points, um, extending Wi-Fi to parking lots, adding access points to libraries and just areas where people could safely go to, to learn that, you know, wasn't necessarily in their households. So, you know, I'm kind of with Andrew here on it's not a perfect answer because it's constantly changing and moving and connectivity will be, uh, you know, the backbone of IT moving forward because we're only moving into a virtual market where most of the things we're doing now will be offered only virtually, you know, in 10 years or so. Absolutely. That's a great point, Melinda. Uh, Chris, as we're just now starting this journey and we're figuring out uh, kind of the without a map um, and as we're looking at connectivity issues. Um, and as Melinda said, you know, this is it's the long haul, you know, as, as we move forward. Um, but we have the bumps in the road now. What do you see uh, IT departments doing right? Uh, and where do you think we need to go to uh, facilitate remote learning? Yeah, it's, it's actually all part of the journey that you know, we've seen schools on for years. I think the one thing that we've seen is just the acceleration of um, these things coming, these trends coming to light. Um, you know, when we started seeing the pandemic hit and schools start to close, uh, one of the first things to do was actually um, help schools get uh, really online. Um, a lot of schools have had online products but haven't really used them. Getting them deployed and ready for uh, use and consumption was actually one of the first things that we were targeted to do. Um, I think one of the pieces of Microsoft strategy in the space has been really thinking about the student experience and the teacher experience and how do we make sure that regardless of where students and teachers are, 
they can be connected and they can get access to the same sorts of content, uh, class structure, assignments, all those different pieces. Um, and we really focused on making sure that as much as possible, we could support students on a mobile phone on a laptop, on a desktop, um, over 5G, 4G, 3G, 2G, whatever kind of wireless network they might have, and making sure that, that experience was something where they could get a, a rich uh, learning experience, even if they're dialing in on a phone call. Um, so that's where you know Teams has really been designed for all those different scenarios to bring that type of learning together. Um, I think going forward, you know, some of the things that we saw were partnerships with uh, telecommunications providers to be able to roll out uh, the puck kind of infrastructure that, uh, that I think Andrew was alluding to. Um, but more than ever, uh, the computing device that students are using as their kind of main uh, access to education has become much more at the forefront. Uh, and we're seeing that become a major challenge, um, you know, and, and that become a major opportunity as well for students to think about their, their learning experience. But for the IT departments, um, the ones that moved quickly to move infrastructure to the cloud or move workloads to the cloud really did take advantage of major scale players like Microsoft and Amazon um, having the infrastructure to support that and making sure that schools could be continuous. Um, so I think that trend is going to continue. Those that didn't go will go. <laughs> I, I have no doubt that we're going to see more schools migrating to the cloud. Um, and getting back to Dr. Ryan's point, I think we're definitely going to see this stay. I mean, if I take a look at what we've seen with Microsoft Teams, uh, we have not seen a shift even for schools that have gone back to in-person. We haven't seen a shift in that usage. So I think it's becoming a new part of the way that we learn, um, supporting students in a different way and even extending to students that don't have physical access to classrooms. Uh, with the weather events happening in the U.S. right now, um, those platforms are facilitating online education, and that's going to be something we need to continue doing. So I think it's setting us up actually to have more flexibility and capability in the future. No more snow days, Chris. They're all virtual now, <laughs> weather days. Thank you so much for that, Chris. And we've, we've talked about this throughout in some of this back and forth banter about um, just the impact and, and lessons learned and, and where we need to go moving forward. We talked about the IT department just in that previous question, but overall, how do you see the lessons learned from 2020 remote learning affecting 2021 and beyond? And I know that hybrid and keeping that hybrid learning model in play is, is also part of that puzzle. So um, Andrew, I'd like to start with you to to get your thoughts and, and beyond the IT department and just whatever lessons they yeah. well, from last year. And it's, it's, a, it's a big question. So I'd say from a macro level, or I think, um, I think it probably just, it just all the lesson learned was we were unprepared. Um, we weren't ready. All the devices there, there's actually a shortage of devices on this planet because we had 1.9 billion learners trying to get access to devices, connectivity, all at the same time. Um, and that was uh, the preparedness was there. But um, And I think uh, the part of the preparedness was also we did not prepare uh, and afford to invest in our teachers uh, enough to even uh, teach. And I would even include faculty. Faculties are incredible. They're all very dynamic. But there's it's been challenging. And right now, I think you're seeing a lot of the fatigue uh, with teachers. Uh, I always say that be nice to your teachers because, you know, not only are they trying to take care of their kids, they're trying to take care of your ours. Uh, and 27% of them are right now, uh, you know, contemplating leaving. Uh, and that was all, we already had a teacher shortage. So this is not good. And so I think we have to invest in our teachers and that's not just any kind of political rhetoric, but also really invest uh, um, in the awareness and ability and that people use professional development, but some basic understanding and patience of, of preparing that. I think at a macro level, we also realize there is a incredible economic tie of what education has right now. That's why there's so much pressure getting back to school or hybrid learning because we have a shortage of even daycare uh, and all those. And even the students themselves right now, the Zoom is so natural. You got their iPads and the Surface uh, devices glued to their eyeballs, but students are feeling more disconnected. So the mental health and physical health actually are going not in the good right direction. So other elements, uh, and I don't think we've figured everything out, but I think there's been a lot of areas, and I call them silver linings and opportunities, because I think now that with data and the amount of devices that are out there, I think there's a whole different method and mechanism of appreciating what those data are and start to use that as an advantage to help teaching and learning and the well-being of everybody. All right, thank you, Andrew. 
And Dr. Ryan, I know you gave plenty of lessons uh, to your students over the past year but uh, and beyond, but uh, what are some of the lessons that you took away from last year and, and how you'll move forward um, either differently or, or just uh, moving forward in general um, in your role? Thank you, Laura. In fact, it's very nice to follow some of the direct points that Andrew just made. Um, it's really forced us as teachers to look at how we teach. Um, it's, it's now a different environment. At, as I briefly mentioned in my introduction, uh, I had been teaching hybrid courses before the pandemic, but now it was exclusively hybrid. So over the summer, uh, all of our faculty, we joined what were called communities of practice. And we started sharing with each other what worked and what didn't work. Now, we've done that in the past, but now there was a real sense of urgency. So we were looking at uh, models which, in, uh, which uh, had the, the uh, flipped classroom. How do I effectively use breakout rooms and polling? Um, how can I be much more interactive? And we learned a lot of things from each other. So I think it's really changing the way that we teach. And as Chris and I were discussing, that's not going away. Um, so I think there's a, a fundamental shift here in how we're viewing uh, our role. Yes, we're educators, but uh, we, get, we need to be interactive, we need to be present, and um, we need maybe different models for teaching. Uh, more use of videos uh, that, that people can watch in advance, so when we come in, we can focus on exercises. So there's a lot of ferment going on within universities um, as to how we can best use this technology, and we see a fundamental change. Absolutely. Dr. Ryan, great points too, um, as well as Andrew. And, and Melinda, Ann, I want to get your take on that as, you know, the teaching model, it sounds like it's it's going to have to shift or adjust or pivot to to where we need it to be. I know that we just kind of jumped with both feet in the fire and now uh, maybe some time to, to move forward and navigate. But what are some of the lessons that you've, you've seen maybe similar to um, Andrew or, or Dr. Ryan? You know, it's it's funny because the most valuable lessons aren't taught, they're experienced. I think technology uh, historically has moved fairly slowly. So it just kind of gave us a jump start into, I think, something we were moving into anyways. So, you know, school-based learning, um, home-based learning for students was one thing, and we're getting through that. But you alluded to, you know, maybe not just in the classroom. So what about the healthcare appointments that you could suddenly do online with your doctor instead of going in, you know, you could just talk to them virtually and they send in a prescription for maybe an appointment that you didn't really need to go to. So there are so many um, lessons that we learned in 2020 that moving forward into 2021, I think will benefit us greatly in the world of technology. Um, if you, you know, scale it back and look at the way uh, companies were budgeting when I'm talking to our IT leaders now, uh, the budget is very different, right? Last year, there was an interim budget. A lot of companies, especially in the school systems, were given grants. Um, one of the school systems here was given $100,000 from Toyota, and it's public knowledge, so I can say that out loud, from Toyota to um, supply them with connectivity solutions. So, um, you know, looking at the way a company budgets for the future of their technology needs will be completely different. And that's because of what we went through in 2020. So, you know, it heavily weighs in on what we did in the interim to what we'll look at for the permanent solutions moving forward. I think it's, a, it's an exciting time and those lessons are um, experiences now. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. Well said, Melinda Ann, rather. Um, and Chris, let's move to you to round out this this topic uh, discussion on, on lessons learned. Yeah, well, I think we ripped the Band-Aid off. So I think uh, 2020 was the year that cloud is no longer a bad word. Um, and I think we know that going forward, it's going to be the foundation of things. Um, I think one of the things that kind of stands out to me is, is the practice that we saw at Microsoft was really the resilience of educators and their creativity um, coming to the forefront. Um, so some of the cool things that we saw happen were, um, you know, uh, sessions to do graduation run on things like Minecraft. Um, so entire schools getting on board with Minecraft as a way to actually still reward students in a virtual environment. 
um, or uh, Flipgrid, which is another Microsoft tool that lets you actually drive social emotional learning by having uh, short video snippets where teachers can capture ideas and students can reflect. And I think the willingness of educators to embrace some of these new tools and bring them into the classroom and bring them into their experience has really changed the dynamics around learning. I think learning has actually become a little bit more personal, personable in terms of how we get connected with students, even though we're at distance. But it's really starting to reflect uh, more of a direct connection. And uh, there's a lot more support for looking at the things that individual learners need. Um, so I'd love to see that continue. Um, I think the fact that now cloud is accepted is, is a great way to start 2021. Um, and I think we're going to see more of those capabilities coming into the learning experience as we Okay, so and thank you, Chris, talking about the opportunities from those lessons learned. And, and we're going to continue that discussion about opportunities. We've been talking a lot about the challenges, uh, which we know that are that we're, we're managing and, and moving forward with um, from 2020 to 2021 and beyond. So with the challenges that are presented, then what are some of the opportunities? And I know that Chris talked about some of those, but Andrew, I'd like to get uh, your your perspective as well. Yeah, thank you. And uh, and it's all incredible stuff here. And, and, and it's easy to talk about the challenges, but as you said, some of the opportunities, um, I think really uh, resonate is that we're all growing up and understanding that we have the technologies there. It's just a matter of now, how do we quickly and intelligently apply? Uh, it, one challenge I would say we haven't really discussed, but it's very much out there is about equity. Um, as we find that there is a significant disproportion of our student population and families of black and brown, um, as well as even special needs, IEPs. Uh, my kids uh, right now are having a hard time learning that way uh, with uh, you know the, the learning challenges they have. Or even learners and families with English as a second language. Now, the opportunity is we have now a more incredible way to see how we can leverage those technologies, whether it's translation services, machine learning, artificial intelligence. We have methods that social media already can predict and understand things and, and create sentiments. Why can't we use that type of same type of um, knowledge and technology and apply it to learning to ensure that, that we start to make education equal? We're not there, a little painful, but now we can start to look at getting away from just surveying and doing polls and you know, getting to real data right on to the actual application of assessments uh, that are happening right on the screen so that people can understand, oh, that's an area that you know, Chris needs a little bit more help or Mary. So again, individualized learning becomes more of a reality. Uh, and, and I think there, the technology is there, it's just a matter of finding the right leader and the right technologist in order to make those solutions real and applied. Well said, thank you, Andrew. Dr. Ryan, uh, what are some of the opportunities that you see from your chair there? Thank you, Laura. From my perspective, what putting this technology into our, our classroom has opened up my classroom. Um, for example, it is so much easier to get industry leaders, many of whom are here today, to give guest lectures, to get our young adults excited about opportunities and careers. It's a much simpler matter to, to go in on the internet. So it's so much easier to get more participation from industry experts, which our undergraduate and graduate students love. Uh, the other thing I've seen, Laura, is um, what would be unacceptable in a classroom, traditional in environment, is now welcomed in a um, hybrid environment. For example, if I'm discussing something, someone may feel more comfortable sending me a private chat than asking the question in uh, class. And if they send a public chat, I've seen this and it's fantastic. As I'm busy answering maybe someone else's question, Mary may ask a question, and John says, oh, I think I know the answer. And he responds. So it's like you have side discussions, which would be chaotic in a normal classroom. But it works. It works in an online environment. So I think the opportunities are it opens up the classroom and the students can now participate better. And we can have invited uh, speakers. It's actually pretty exciting. Thanks, Laura. Wonderful. I, I just love the positivity and the excitement around, you know, even though around the corner we you know, it's uh, kind of going blindly over the past year, but really um, putting our footprint and moving forward. Um, but it's really exciting to see the enthusiasm behind all this, even though with challenges uh, present, you know, what are the opportunities that that we have in front of us? So Melinda Ann, what are, what are the, some of the opportunities that you see uh, that we could take advantage of? 
Sure, and I love this question, Laura, because we are really a glass half full organization. So when you look at you know campus leaders having to assess their day to day normal IT challenges and add a pandemic on top of that, which you know let's now find a solution for a problem we've never ever had to experience. You know that's an art. So. For me, the opportunities here are kind of twofold, right? One for the provider and one for the end user. So in, in the Metro Detroit area, we have roughly 500,000 people or so who have one point in their life started a bid toward higher education and then they had to drop out. So they haven't completed it um, for whatever reason, work, school, life got in the way. Now that we've had this uh, time to um, really hone in on, on remote learning and virtual learning platforms, there are flexibility in course and program offerings. And we're seeing this throughout the nation for our higher education. Schools that traditionally maybe would never ever have wanted to move toward an online program are now seeing, you know what, it really did work for social work or you know psychology, whatever it was. And they can offer that. They now have an entire um, bank of prospects, prospective students in an enrollment funnel that they never would have had before. So, you know, the, the opportunity is there for the institutions, more so in the higher ed space, less so in the K-12 space, because they really are looking to get back on premise and teach in person, um, which, you know, I think we all feel is necessary. If you think about it, just two years ago, we were worried about what happens if an active shooter comes into your establishment. That was access control, right? Let's lock the doors. Let's let's provide some training. Fast forward, now we're wondering what happens if somebody walks into our establishment and coughs on this doorknob, right? Without wearing a mask. So still access control. The same solution, just a different definition behind that need. So opportunity definitely hasn't gone away. IT is ever changing. And you know, this pandemic and, and 2020 has been a true lesson for everybody. Opportunity is still there. Thank you, Melinda Ann. Chris, I know that you talked about some of those um, opportunities just a little bit in your last response, but uh, if you could expand a little bit and maybe some other opportunities that you're that you're finding. Yeah, I think, you know, this is going to be, um, there's going to be a real silver lining here, which is, uh, to some of the other speakers' points, particularly Melinda Ann, um, we've built resilience into the education system in a way that has never been there before. So if we look at weather events, we look at anything that happens that would in historically shut down a school, you know, we can get past that today based on the response that we've put in here. So I think we've really built up a new level of resilience in the infrastructure providing education. Um, I think one of the things, and I talk to universities on a daily basis, I think one of the big things that it opens the door for is thinking about new business models and how does university um, extend the reach into other students who may not have that access today, as was mentioned before. How do we connect uh, students with employers in a more uh, direct way? So how can we build programs that overlap between uh, employment and education? And how do we think about um, you know, new revenue streams for universities as they're going forward? Because I think the uh, enrollment issues in the US are certainly going to be a headwind for universities. And there's that opportunity to build out new channels here, either for education directly or things like research. Um, so I just look at this whole shift to a, uh, a more flexible digital environment as opening quite a few doors that were you know, really not open before based on uh, legacy infrastructure. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you all. I'll thank you all in just a moment uh, because we are uh, rounding out um, our time together. We do, though, have time for one question from our audience. Uh, just remember, if we don't have time to get to your question, hold that question for the networking lounge. We're going to head over there in just a few seconds. So I believe, raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Uh, I did see some questions come through. I think Ian Horowitz your question is prompted first here, so I want to get to you. I want to see if you want to come on camera and ask a question yourself, or would sure. you like us? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm on camera, but I'm here. Oh, there I there am. There you are. Yes, we so, see you. Hey, everyone. I appreciate all the panelists making time for us today. This has been a really uh, interesting topic, and considering uh, what we're all going through. And, you know, you think back over the last 20 years or so that so many of us that are watching or participating in this call today, you know, the work that we've all done, you know, the internet now is doing what it was built to do. And it's because of what so many of us have been, uh, we, we've, what we've done to, to make it happen. 
and it's exciting. Um, the question I had is, and, and Chris, you too touched on, Andrew, you've all touched on a little bit. When you look at the students today, whether it's K through 12 university that are all doing remote learning, you know, wh where do you see this going by 2025 or 2030? I mean, knowing how technology, every 10 years, something new and exciting is coming out. Um, and, you know, what, what is your um, thoughts on where we're going to be 10 years from now? Uh, who's that question to, Laura? Is it? <laughs> no, that's, that's, I'm curious what you all, you all have a different take on. I'm curious uh, you know, what you all think about that. Uh, if I'll, t I'll take a first quick uh, thing. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ian, for your question. Uh, I say it's almost going to be like a consumerization. And I know that might sound silly, but uh, and I'll use a, I'll give a little shout out to the Microsoft tagline that they've had for a long time. So anywhere, anytime learning is realized already today. I think um, that would ultimately unshackle. I think there's going to be a lot of questions about how funding, because right now we have a time based degree based versus skill based type of education system uh, time in the K through 12. That's how funding works. It's seat time. That's going to be questioned. I think degrees. What is that really worth? Why am I paying so much is occurring now? And ultimately, am I going to get something that I can become a great digital or a citizen or get a job? So to me right now that those three areas are sort of in this sort of battle between our public education, higher education, vocational, as well as lifelong learning, calling it K to gray. And this learning is going to be a continuum. And I'm going to be able to hopefully be able to get the things I want to learn and not always be burdened by just some sequence of curriculum that may or may not be important to me. Skill-based, micro-credentialing. Like a, there's a company called Midas Education. They're already in the state of Utah, Nevada, building micro-credentialing. Um, <clears throat> and all the information that's coming along is going to be incredibly important. The, the use of data. Like there's a company called Lightspeed that's starting to now look at the information, what's happening a lot on the actual devices, and that's going to start to unearth. So I would say data is the gig economy, uh, and that's the new currency. And we, we're becoming the products, but we get to drive what we want, not be it bestowed upon us. I would agree 100% with Andrew on, on those trends. Like we're seeing skill-based micro-credentialing coming to the forefront. I think a uh, number of new institutions this week announced their micro-credential uh, initiatives. I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> they are out there and they're, they're increasing in frequency. Um, I think the other thing in the short term that we're going to see is a lot more adoption of new technology to support the learning process. Um, one of the best examples that we saw of really being innovative with technology was thinking about mixed reality to help medical students finish their degrees. Um, and we're going to see tools like that continue to help support the learning process and get away from just this sort of, um, you know, translation onto the screen to really rethinking some of the way the curriculum gets delivered and how we need to help our next generation of educators um, really embrace that technology as a fundamental part of their experience. So totally agree with Andrew and think we're going to see some huge innovation over the next five years and the way that learning is actually uh, delivered and how we see that, that process uh, taking place. I would just very quickly add, I know we're getting near the end of time, but I, I think Chris and uh, yeah, he has hit upon a certain key points. As a professor, uh, all things are on the table. What can I now do to teach better? And, you know, we're looking at perhaps augmented reality, virtual reality. So when you talk about something in physics or engineering, you can now visualize it better. So really, this has forced us, uh, as a, forced me as a professor to think about what can I do differently to engage and to excite students more. Thanks, Chris. Yep, and, and I'll just add real quick. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, I think the K-12 market, we're really they're going to stay pretty much the same as they were before, maybe revert back a little bit, but have those offerings in place if a student needs a hybrid model. You know, I think in that market though, you really need, um, you really want maybe to have an on-premise model for a K-12 student. In the higher education market though, I think that's where, you know, you'll see those expanded course offerings. Uh, universities and colleges will have the ability to offer way more than they have in the past, and they'll have a different, broader audience. And I think that is really key here to, to opportunities for, you know, anything that we've done in the last uh, year as far as remote learning goes. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ian, for that wonderful question and panelists for answering. We have lots of great questions still lined up in our queue. 
Um, we're going to get to all of those on the other side in just a moment. But first, I do want to thank our panelists for joining us today and everyone for participating in our roundtable um, and your great questions that were uh, that were sent in. Just a reminder, though, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour, so you, they will answer any more of your questions. We're going to head over to the networking lounge at their table, and they'll be there to answer your questions, and you can pop on video and talk to them directly. So uh, really be interactive face-to-face. -face. And viewers, if you're one of the first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. We hope it was yummy and delicious and um, just wonderful hour, and thank you so much for being part of us with this hour. Um, we're going to have more JSA roundtables for you coming up throughout the year, so make sure you go to jsa.net to register for more of those upcoming roundtables. The next one takes place March 18th. That one's going to be about rising above COVID-19 hybrid cloud applications. That is a wrap for us. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, we'll see you over in the networking lounge. Happy networking. Thank you.